Let us pray. Father, it's good to come into your house to worship you. We've lifted our voices in song. We've read of the promises from your sacred word. We open our lives to you, Father, with hearts filled with love for the gift of your only begotten Son. So bless us with your presence and quiet our spirits today as we gather around your throne of grace. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. It is that time of year again, isn't it? Guys are getting a little nervous, but they've got plenty of time. New Year's Eve doesn't come for five more days, and they can get their shopping done then. Like deer in the headlights, they will go into the store and just say, can you help me? And uh, the sales clerk will say, what is it you want? They'll say, I'm not sure, but something nice for her. And they will walk out of that store well relieved that they have gotten what their wife wants, or so they think. It's an interesting time of year. You pull in the parking lot, and already it's hard to find a parking space. You circle the parking lot for 10 minutes, and when somebody pulls out of the parking space, you think you've gotten a Christmas present in just being able to park your car. It's that time of year, isn't it, where children start behaving a little bit better in full anticipation that they will make their beds and do the dishes only being asked once in hopes that Santa will find them nice and not naughty. It's that time of year. And that time of year, when you think of Thanksgiving anyway, you think of what? Turkey. And when you think of Christmas, you think of what? Christmas, Christmas gifts. My message is simply today entitled, The Gift. So what would be Christmas without a bit of a Christmas story? So for children this morning, we'll start our message, children, I might add, of all ages, from 2 to 92, with a bit of a Christmas story that James Magruder has written, I believe that illustrates a very fundamental principle of the gift. So he writes, I never wanted a gift more in my life. It was a simple gift, really a record player. For those of you who don't know what a record player is, I'll translate that for you. It is an old-fashioned CD player. You ask mom and dad and grandma and grandpa about it, they will fill you in on the details. It was before the era of component stereo systems. And as a 14-year-old, I wanted total control of my music. I, will still I was still riding the boom of the British invasion of the Beatles and was tired of painfully waiting for the radio to randomly play my favorite songs. If I owned just a record player, the specific model I pinpointed in the Sunday newspaper sales circulars. I could listen to my music anytime in the privacy of my bedroom. That is in whatever privacy existed in a bedroom shared with two brothers. I was one of six children in a single parent home. My mother had died two years earlier after a short but brutal bout with cancer. We were an average middle-class family before that, but now, although my father is a successful accountant, 
from a major automobile manufacturer, for a major automobile manufacturer, six hungry mouths to feed on one income challenged everything and changed everything. We weren't scraping by, but there were plenty of hand-me-down extras. Hand-me-down clothes were a way of life. Yet we were a solid family run by a disciplined man with rigid schedule, strict rules and daily routines that kept life organized, efficient and very predictable. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, I poured over the sale circulars in the Sunday papers to ensure my record player was still being advertised. If it were on sale, I would have one more reason to pitch my father on why I needed, I needed, not just wanted, that record player. Looking back, my father must have been overwhelmed or worse, inadequate, doing Christmas shopping alone for three sons and three daughters. I wondered if he had asked himself, how will I ever make everyone happy? How can I equally treat each of them? How can I make sure each have received the gift they wanted? Will this Christmas be meaningful? And most importantly, will the finances stretch enough this particular Christmas? He asked my aunt and uncle to help him do the shopping that Christmas. I caught them at the door as they came in and made sure they had a circular with the thing that I wanted circled with big black magic marker. I had great expectations for Christmas that year, despite my father's noncommittal reaction to my entreaties after church that Christmas Eve. We gathered in the living room in our quaint Cape Cod home. I don't remember which one of the six of us was selected to hand out the gifts while the rest of us watched and waited. I was far too busy surveying every package under the tree. There was good news, plenty of gifts for everyone, and bad news as well. No large gift there big enough to be a record player. I enjoyed watching my brothers and sisters received what they had hoped for on what was probably our first Christmas of significance and healing after our mother's death. Still we felt her absence, none more than my father, for me, the thought of receiving the gift would be a healing in my life. Not receiving the coveted gift, I felt would be a rejection. You feel when you're chosen last for a team. I guess I knew it was simply too much to ask. Yet I wondered how to question my father at such, this, such a time as this. Finally, I mustered up the words, Dad, I think something is missing, I said. Really? What? He replied. Stunned, I said, well, I was hoping for, and my voice trailed off. Have you checked under the tree, he suggested. Yes, but have you checked in the tree, he added. In the tree, I remarked. I riffled through the branches, careful not to disturb the ornaments. In the back of the tree, was an envelope. Across the middle of it was written, look in the basement, in the clothes dryer. I ran as fast as I could and looked around the dryer. Nothing. Popped the door open and looked inside the dryer, hoping another envelope. I opened it in great haste. Look in the closet in Mary and Joni's bedroom. 
I ran back across the house, up the stairs, to my sister's closet. I opened another note with the next clue. This process continued until my father had me run all over the house. The thrill of the hunt intensified with every note. At last, I discovered the final note. Look under your bed. With my heart pounding and in full anticipation, I raced upstairs to my room and looked under the bed. There wrapped in newspapers was a large gift. There was the record player as I tore the paper wrappings from it. It was not the one that I wanted. It was far better. I was stunned. I knew I didn't deserve it. It was a major name brand. It symbolized and carried two words of great quality in that era. Solid state. I excitedly plugged it in and spent the afternoon with my siblings listening to my favorite records over and over and over and over again. My father would never know the full impact of what he did for me that Christmas. I used this cherished gift all through high school and college. In fact, I used it long after the technology had passed by. I'm sure my father would have gotten satisfaction if I had used it for just a few years and passed it on. I used it for 10 years. Eventually, I replaced it and carefully put it in storage. It survived numerous spring cleanings, rummage sales, and moving days. In the end, I kept it for 37 years. This Christmas, he wrote, it's been 47 years since I opened the gift. It remains the most memorable gift. I've ever received. Why did I keep it so long? I suppose it's because of the powerful message behind the gift that my father unknowingly sent me. The value of the gift is not it's worth. It's what it says about your worth to the giver. The gift. In all of the busyness of this season, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ is about what God and how God values you. So this morning, I'd like to share with you three simple texts. Three simple texts. We've already read them. John chapter 1, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. The gift of our Lord Jesus Christ was God's greatest gift that he could give. For you see, in giving that gift, he could have given any gift to the world. He could have said, all of your sins are forgiven by one proclamation of heaven. But he sent... He sent His only begotten Son into the Bethlehem manger that you and I might find salvation today, friends. Such an amazing and incredible gift. But it's an incredible gift of how our Heavenly Father values each one of us. I find it an incredible gift because it shows us 
that God was proactive, proactive in seeking us. When we sin and turn our backs on Him, He still chases after us. When we've ignored Him and become indifferent, He's still longing for us to turn around and come to Him. I can't fathom. I, I only begin to scratch the surface of that understanding. In my humanity, when people say, you know, I've heard enough, I kind of let them go. And I wait for an opening and re-engage. But God continues to seek and search and proactively call you through his, by His Holy Spirit. First John chapter 4, verse 9 and 10. This is how God showed His love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. What amazing love. What a gift! What, what an example of what true love is all about. A love that doesn't wait. A love that goes in search in spite of what we have done. In spite of our past. In spite of our neglect of His calling us in times past. He calls again and again. Zechariah, passage that we've read. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you. How? The Bible promises He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt you. He will exalt over you with loud singing. A proactive God, a God who will draw close to you in those times when your life is all turned upside down, in your times when things are not going the way that you anticipated, in those times of brokenness, in their times of betrayal, in those times of lowliness, He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you. And He will fill your heart with His presence. The gift is a gift of our Heavenly Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. Journey with me back to Bethlehem and that manger scene. The gift. Have you spent time in Bethlehem? Have you looked into the eyes of that innocent baby? And you wonder, you, I love children of all ages. When you take the baby home from the hospital, there's nothing more innocent in the world, is there? There's nothing so life-changing in the world. You see, they want to be fed at 2 o'clock in the morning. It doesn't matter what your schedule is. When something comes up, you have to tend to their needs. But the gift of His only begotten Son to come into this sinful world, to be born, of God and of man, the incarnation, to take on all of the sins of the world. I only begin to scratch that understanding. No sin is so deep in your life. No sin is so heinous that it keeps you from a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father. It is the Bethlehem message today, friends, of the depth of His love. I love and cherish the third piece, that no matter where you've been, no matter where life will take you, that God's gift to you today is that He will always be there beside you. Do you see the gift? How He wants to be invited into your life today. His proactive love. You may have wandered from Him 20 years ago. You may be back visiting family today and in this church the first time in 20 years. It doesn't matter. 
You may have been in a follower of him for 20 years and thought this week, I'm going to lay it all beside. It doesn't matter. He's proactively calling you today to the Bethlehem manger in a relationship of love with him. Romans chapter 8, verse 37 through 39, is the, problem, is the promise that God makes to you. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, the gift of love of our Lord Jesus Christ. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Do you like that promise? Do you like that gift? Nothing above, nothing below, nothing this direction, nothing that direction can separate us from the gift of love of our Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, I ask you today, during this season of year, the gift is extended to you today. But the gift, by way of illustration, placed in the manger at Bethlehem, needs to be picked up and needs to be allowed into your heart and into your life today. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you today, don't be shy. Before we continue in our service, I'd like to have a special prayer for you today. If God is speaking to your heart today, and you say, Lord, I just want to open my heart to you today. I want during this season of year that the love of the Lord Jesus Christ might fill me, might go with me from this place in such a way that it will buoy me up during those difficult times, in such a way that those times of loneliness, those times of despair, I will sense your presence, that out of my heart might flow the gift of love to others. I just invite you just to come forward, and I'm going to have a special word of prayer for you just now. Don't worry about those that are seated next to you. Just come join me. We'll have a season of prayer, and thank the Lord for the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, there are many reasons for this season. And in the busyness of this season, Father, in all of our comings and goings, in all of our time with family and friends, and all the presents and gifts exchanged, we come here today, Father, to open our hearts and our lives to you. We come here today, Father, because it's a stretch for us to even begin to vocalize full appreciation to you for the gift of your only begotten Son. Lord, we just open our lives to you, Father, and we open our hearts to you that they might be filled by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, filled with the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
that out of our hearts and our lives, that love might flow forth to others. Father, it's not only the gift that you've given to us in Bethlehem, but Father, we come amazed at how you value us in giving your only begotten Son. We are just awestruck that you allow us into your presence. And we surrender our lives anew, Father, to you. That just as Jesus lived out his life for you, we might do so also. So, Father, for each who've come, give them the blessings that they are seeking today as they silently petition your throne of grace, that their lives will be so filled that out of their life will flow the manifestation of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ into the lives of others. So we seek this gift, that we might give it and share it with others. We ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. May the Lord bless each one of you.